I'm Roger Citron, and I'm a professor of law at Toro College, Jacob E. Fuchsberg Law Center. This is the Toro Law Review podcast, and we're delighted today to have with us Adam Zimmerman. And uh, Adam, we always start the podcast. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll get into our subject, which is um, opioid litigation, including a case that's currently pending um, in New York, in Suffolk County, and that for a number of weeks was actually held at the uh, Toro Law Center itself. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. I mean, professionally, I'm a law professor at Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. Uh, I have been working in the field of complex litigation, which is also what I write about, um, for now 20 years. Uh, I began my career clerking for now the late Judge Weinstein. Um, uh, after that, I worked with Ken Feinberg on the September 11 fund. And, you know, when I, when I originally got into this line of work, it was something of a surprise. You know, I, I went to law school wanting to be a public interest lawyer and a civil rights lawyer. And then I, I clerked for Jack Weinstein and, and you know, the judge, um, the judge's earliest, uh, some of his earliest and most famous legal experiences was actually working on the Brown v. Board legal team. Um, and uh, this was when he was a young law professor. But um, working on those desegregation cases and hearing desegregation cases themselves, uh, himself in New York involving um, schools in Coney Island and in Brooklyn, um, really ultimately ended up shaping the way he approached mass torts. You know, for him, a mass tort, one that might involve the exposure of veterans to Agent Orange, to uh, women exposed to DES. You know, raised some of the same type of profound implications for kind of our public health and our society as civil rights cases. And, and for the judge, he saw mass tort cases as civil rights cases. And his, his chief innovation was to take the same types of tools that we sometimes use in structural reform litigation to bring in lots of people, to hear from all the different stakeholders, to sometimes travel as a court around the country, sometimes hearing from different people who are impacted by a giant global deal, you know, that all, all of those tools that he used were tools that, you know, kind of grew out of the 60s and 70s structural reform litigation, and, and he began using in mass torts. So when I began clerking for him, I kind of saw that mass torts was kind of an extension of some of the civil rights work that I wanted to do. Um, and working with Ken Feinberg, I kind of also saw that mixture of the public and the private and working on the September 11 fund compensating people for mass harms. And I, uh, I litigated these types of cases for another six or seven years, and then I became an academic. Um, and now I write about class actions and I write about um, how government agencies sometimes perform some of the same goals as class actions. And, um, and, I, and I write about the public and private dynamics of how these massive cases impact all of us. Um, and uh, not, you know, personally, you know, I live here in Studio City, California. I have a son. I have a cute dog that might come in the screen at any moment. Uh, wife working as she has been for the past year and a half in the next room. Um, and uh, I, you know, I teach torts and civil procedure and mass torts, and I love my students. And and I, 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 I love I love doing what I do. Um, no, that's great, and it. Yeah. I say this sincerely, it, it's a coherent whole, right? Your life makes sense. So congratulations on that. You know, it um, does make sense, but for law students out there, like it was not a plan. Like I, like if you look, if I look back over the past 20 years, it looks like an arc that I planned and everything was accidental. The only reason why I clerked for the judge was because my um, my good friend was clerking for the judge next door to her and said, oh, Judge Weinstein has a seat open. And so I applied. And then the only reason why well, it wasn't the only reason, but well, the primary reason why I stayed in New York to work on the September 11 fund is because I was dating my wife, who was then my girlfriend. And I wanted to stay in New York as opposed to like go back to the San Francisco law firm. And then everything just was just happening. <laughs> and and then when I look back, it looks like it all makes sense. So that's that's how life, I think, works. Um it's wise uh, to remind us that outside 
the classroom, serendipity plays a role yeah. in, for, in life for all of us. Yeah. Um, what have you been uh, in, in your professional work, that is, especially in your, in your research and scholarship, um, what, if anything, have you been doing in connection with the opioid litigation? Um, there have been a number of cases, including the one uh, ongoing in, in the New York State Court. Um, what have you done with that? Generally? Well, that, well, that's a good question. So I, I actually haven't written my piece on the opioid litigation. I, I'm actually kind of glad that I haven't yet because I feel like every year this particular litigation keeps changing. But I'll tell you how I approach it from my other scholarship and um, what I think is so interesting about it. So, you know, I began a strand of writing um, about a decade ago that really started thinking about how other institutions in our legal system work a lot like class actions. So a class action is complicated because in a class action, it typically will involve a lot of people who are hurt in a similar way. And there are so many people that the court has to kind of come up with a procedure to deal with it. Um, uh, and there's a lot of pressure on that procedure just simply because there's so many people and the law usually for resolving that problem might not be all that clear. Um, and uh, typically what happens in the end is you just get a massive settlement that tries to figure out how to adequately treat individuals as individuals while still usually providing like, um, like a lot of consistency and uniformity in how the awards are paid out, often in a way that kind of looks like a grid. And many people have compared like the class action settlement payout to what an administrative agency like social security might do or workers comp might do. And so I began like writing a little bit about like, well, are there other ways that agencies and, and criminal prosecutors actually do the same types of jobs as class actions? And one way they do that at least at the time people hadn't really been writing about is that sometimes an agency um, using its own equitable authority would go out and collect money from a big institution or person, Madoff or WorldCom, collect billions of dollars, and then also have to kind of make these decisions that class actions make about who gets what. And the same thing applies for criminal prosecutors too. Well, the most recent example is the Boeing 737 MAX case where there's been ongoing litigation you know, in civil court but it was a bargain struck between the U.S. Attorney's Office and Boeing that produced a multi-billion dollar settlement that's going to be administered by Ken Feinberg, who I also work for, who's usually associated with class actions, but he's going to be in charge of like distributing these funds through this other totally different mechanism. And so I began writing about like, oh, you know, here are all these other institutions that do the same thing. We don't really have rules for thinking about who gets what, what kind of transparency they should have, what type of participation people should have in the process. Um, so what should it be? Like, what should they look like, given that they're also serving these other kinds of public regulatory goals and criminal justice goals at the same time? Um, and the reason why all that I think is relevant to opioids is because I think what opioids really presents is a case where all of these institutions that we have to kind of deal with a really big problem and try to resolve it among people are, are being, are being um, leveraged at the same time. So we have 2,000 states, uh, I'm sorry, cities and counties that have all sued. Um, we use, we're, um, and we're using a vehicle called multi-district litigation, which is a little bit like the class action. People always get confused, but it's not quite. Um, to consolidate all those cases together, um, and, and all those cases are kind of being brought together along with like Native American tribes. Then we have a whole bunch of state attorneys general that are also using their own independent authority in their own state courts, because thinking back to civil procedure, like they, they states actually are not the type of party that has to be brought into federal court under diversity jurisdiction. So as long as they don't have a federal question, they could stay in their own state courts. They're all proceeding in their own state courts. And then you have bankruptcy courts um, that provide another avenue for resolving these cases. And then lurking in the background is this 800 pound gorilla, the, the federal government that can seek criminal restitution. Um, even though a bankruptcy usually stops everything, 
the one thing that a bankruptcy can't stop is the criminal justice division collecting massive criminal fines and restitution, potentially preventing anyone from getting any money at all. Um, all of them have the power to not only collect funds um, due to the damages from the opioid epidemic, but also distribute those funds to many different types of groups. They can distribute it in some cases to individuals, um, to foundations and other organizations as part of a settlement. Um, and so how does our legal system deal with that? It was already hard enough with just a class action in one court, but how do we deal with like the possibility of all these different settlement rivals? Um, and, and what does it mean if at least one of the primary concerns has historically been in mass towards how do we come up with like kind of efficient and global resolution when all of these different parties are at rival with each other. So that's what I'm working on. I want to call it multi everything litigation. The idea that there's not just a single multi district litigation, which is how these things are typically there's like, but there's just like all of these other structures in our government that have to deal with this. Um, and um, as a result, if your goal is global peace, you have to work through all of them at once. You have to have a mindset. We are thinking about criminal prosecutions. You're thinking about the agency regulators. You're thinking about the potential for bankruptcy or the or a settlement and multi district litigation. And you're also thinking about the state legislatures that might all stand to kind of ultimately collect this money um, and have to pass a law as to how that money is going to be distributed. So with that sort of overview, yeah. um, it's I, big, it's a lot. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have a whiteboard here at <laughs> home. We could put everyone up on the, all the actors up there. Can you, can we sort of zero in a little bit um, more specifically um, on the opioid litigation? And I guess there's sort of two parts to that. One is, you know, what's going on in New York with the trial that, um, as I mentioned, I think at the beginning, you know, was held for a number of weeks, uh, not only in Suffolk County, but actually at the law school. But then situating that particular litigation, which is taking place in a state court, um, in the context of other opioid actions taking place. In other words, you ticked off a number of different actors and not only um, civil litigation, um, uh, you know, brought, uh, you know, against, say, manufacturers or distributors, um, and even in the, the New York case, the, the retail chains, um, but, um, you know, where other people might sort of fit in, whether that might, would be, you know, the, the prospect of criminal prosecution. Um, uh, I know there's litigation going on in other states. Um, so, I, there was a question in there somewhere. I, I got the question. I think I can do it. So, I'll so give I'll you... Stop. I'll give you like a blueprint for how I think of what the opioid litigation, what I think makes it unique. I can say a few things about New York, even though I haven't followed it that closely. I can at least say a little bit about like what's happened in New York and how it kind of maps on with at least other things that have happened. And maybe then I can zoom back out and then talk a, couple, a little bit about just how this fits in within just the overall picture. So big picture, what makes opioids different and unique, and not just a mega mass tort, but a mega mega mass tort, <laughs> is that um, it's it's incredibly complicated on both sides of the V. So on the plaintiff side, we have um, counties, cities, um, uh, uh, um, Native American tribes. Um, we have class actions brought on behalf of individuals, um, uh, uh, on behalf of babies who were born addicted, um, all uh, pursuing remedies against a assortment of defendants at each stage of the opioid supply chain. At the manufacturing stage, we have big um, companies like Johnson & Johnson, Teva, um, Purdue Pharmaceuticals, Endo, um, that all have uh, are alleged to have violated um, federal RICO statutes in some cases, 
negligence statutes, nuisance laws, but the underlying allegation against the manufacturers, so going all the way back to the beginning, is that they understated the addictive qualities of opioids um, and aggressively marketed them in a variety of ways, despite the fact that they are a heavily regulated controlled substance. To the point at which like our use of opioids, if you look back from when they began marketing them and then ultimately encouraging doctors to prescribe pain pills more, we'll see that this incredible increase that you, and you see this in every trial, this incredible increase in opioid use that coincides with those marketing campaigns. So the allegations against them is that they, they marketed and understated the addictive qualities of these drugs and people got hooked. For the distributors, the theory is slightly different. Um, the distributors, it's not that because they are not marketers, they're not really saying anything. So instead, in the middle of the opioid supply chain, we have these huge pharmaceutical companies that just distribute drugs all over the country. But they are, as under our, uh, um, our federal drug laws, required to kind of spot unusual and illicit sales um, and then report that to the federal government. Um, um, and uh, they are they are essentially charged with putting their heads in the sand. So the, at the manufacturer level, we have lying, lying about the addictive qualities of the drugs, encouraging people to take the drugs when they might not need them. And the distributing level, we have not saying anything. And the theory against the pharmaceutical companies is kind of similar, but they are they're different in, in two ways. I mean, one is that what they are seeing might not be um, at the same kind of national scale. What they might be seeing in, is, is like the overprescribing in their own communities. But at the same time, these are probably the most prominent brand names that people know and inter interact with. It's Walmart, it's Walgreens, CVS. Um, and so we're talking about the kinds of pharmacies that that people that are just household names um, that people are really familiar with. Um, and I do think that as a result of that, they have historically, at least when you kind of just look at how the settlements have come down, like they've they've been the most resistant to settle, in fact, um, and, and have been the most aggressive litigators. Um, up until the eve of trial, but they're the most aggressive litigators. So, so I think at one point last year, we actually saw Walmart sue the federal government. The, like, as the federal government was suing it, it sued the federal government saying it was the federal government that was really to blame for this. And they were just scapegoating Walmart. That, that case was just dismissed um, about j just a little while ago. I think it was just a few months ago. Um, but it just kind of illustrates just how um, vigorously, at least at the pharmaceutical level, um, those claims have been litigated. So um, it's a similar theory against them. It's that they've also failed to spot red flags, but their ability to spot red flags is a little bit different. Um, and and they, they claim that because of what everyone else has done, um, they're really the, they're just following the orders of everyone else. You know, the doctor prescribes the drug, um, the drugs are being distributed to them. Other people are lying about them. They're just filling in orders, and it's not theirs. You know, it's not their responsibility. Now, what was going to make the New York litigation very unique was that, in almost all the other litigations, because of the variety of claims and players on that defendant side of the V, um, it almost always meant that if you were bringing a lawsuit, you were just going to bring them against the manufacturers or it was just going to be the distributors or just the pharmacy or just the pharmacies and the pharmacies were always kind of the the last in line so there had been um, some cases like in Oklahoma where Johnson and Johnson was involved in a very large trial and again you know it doesn't it makes sense that you have like the major company with a brand name litigating that case because it's Johnson and Johnson, you know, like no, they, they really wanted to disassociate themselves from these other companies that people just hadn't really heard of. And so they litigated, they lost in, in a really big case. And that case is now being appealed up to the Oklahoma courts. Um, um, but uh, originally what the judge was going to do in that case is just have the manufacturers. And indeed in the, um, um, in some of the initial bellwether trials um, for cases that are all kind of consolidated in a single federal courthouse in Ohio, um, those were also going to be against manufacturers. Um, 
And uh, there was one case, I want to say it's the case, uh, another federal case in West Virginia, um, where it was just going to be distributors. Um, but this was going to be against all three. And the reason why that's important is because finally, there'd be a situation where people couldn't point at the empty chair. They couldn't point at the people who were not in the room and blame them for the epidemic. And that tends to be the strategy on the defense side, if I'm being overly simplistic. I mean, I think there's a lot of other legal arguments that they can have been making, but their strategy, at least in court, it is, has been to kind of say, it's, it's been someone else. Sometimes they point to the distributors who could have seen it. Sometimes if the manufacturers, you point, they point to the, the cities themselves and say, you know, you approve these drugs to come in, but they usually point at somebody else. And in New York, the theory or thinking was that that wasn't going to happen. Every, every member of the supply chain was going to be there. But also because every member of the supply chain was going to be there, it was going to be a total circus. And uh, as a result, you couldn't have it in the courthouse. They had to have it at a place like Toro Law School, um, where it just had to be like a big enough forum to hold all those places up. The, the closest analogy I can think of might harken back to the tobacco litigation where they, they held like a major tobacco trial in like a big uh, Louisiana stadium. Um, and it's, so it's the same type of thing. But what, what really makes this complicated is like, unlike other historic mass torts, whether it's asbestos, tobacco, guns, um, all of which have involved public entities. You know, what we have here is a case where like every possible member of the supply chain um, is involved. Um, it makes it an incredibly difficult case to try. Um, the defendants fearing that they will be confused with other defendants tend to settle. And that's what happened in New York. Um, the last thing I'll say, so that was like the big picture, what's going, what happened in New York. And the last thing I was going to say is like, where does this fit in the big picture? And the big picture is that we've already had some major settlements. Um, they're at different levels of approval, but the biggest one so far um, by a single player is probably Purdue Pharma, which went into bankruptcy, but um, has, I think its settlement is like a $4.5 billion settlement. Um, a number of state AGs have challenged it, um, but uh, we'll, we'll see how that ultimately goes. And, but the, the really big reason why that settlement kind of took on the shape that it did was because actually what I was saying before about the federal government, the federal government said um, that it would not seek criminal fines, which would have totally depleted all of the money that Purdue could kind of pay out through the bankruptcy. If the settlement looked in a certain way, like Purdue was going to be a public company that um, that was no longer going to be like run by the Sacklers, that was going to just kind of be a public trust. Um, and that was going to be a lot of the going value. And some, some states really like that along with the money they were getting, but there were a number of states that were like, we don't want to Purdue Pharma anymore at all. Um, and so that's one of the big objections. So the public health community has begun to kind of mobilize around some of the settlements that are already brokered and that are some that are coming down the pike. Purdue Pharma is one, there's $4 billion there. And there's a tentative $26 billion settlement that the state AGs have negotiated with the major distributors. Um, and what's really left are pharmacies. Um, and pharmacies, um, I know some of the pharmacies have settled in New York, but by and um, overall, the pharmacies really haven't had their day in court yet, unlike the others. And so um, just this week, the first um, trials against the major pharmacies, including Walmart, Walgreens, and um, um, uh, CVS started uh, in a federal courthouse in Cleveland. And the outcomes of those cases might be kind of the final piece in the puzzle to kind of see what happens, you know, because it will be the first time that like at least every component of the supply chain ha will have had their day in court. And these are typically seen as bellwethers, like if, if there's a big damage verdict for the cases to settle in a certain way. But if there isn't, then, um, then um, maybe they continue to litigate. The game, the game, the play on. Yeah. Um, the uh, I appreciate that you took us high, then you know zoomed in, or took us broadly, and then zoomed in, and then sort of zoomed back out. Mm -hmm. um, when you were laying out, you know, both sides of the V, um, one theory 
that you noted that plaintiffs were asserting, which I believe is the theory um, or central theory in New York, um, is the nuisance theory. Um, can you say a little bit more about the contours of that type of claim and not only sort of, if you will, the elements um, of establishing liability, but also what that might mean in terms of, um, you know, the remedy sought and, you know, where any funds gathered or collected or awarded through a public nuisance theory, what, what does that mean uh, for prevailing plaintiffs if they have prevailed on a, a nuisance theory? Yeah. Um, so nuisance sits at the middle of property and tort law. I teach a tort class and I never get to it. And I always think my property law professor is going to teach it. And she always thinks I'm going to teach it. But the essence behind a nuisance claim is that someone has unreasonably interfered with your ability um, to use the land. And that's usually the defined as a private nuisance. Like someone is blasting music or someone is um, has like really smelly stuff next door and the fumes and vapors come to your household like it's interfering with your ability to kind of in your private enjoyment of the land um, a public nuisance is a little bit different a public nuisance is an interference with a public right and public nuisances have always been ill-defined um, and uh, there's always been a little bit of a debate about what the best way to characterize public nuisance law is is it a tort you know, given that it's a public right, you're trying to say that someone has created a nuisance to the public. Um, does it have to have some relationship to property at all? I mean, that's something the defendants continue to say, but they they are and they are not right about that. And I'll explain in a second. Um, is it more akin to criminal law where because it's a violation of people's ability in public to just take advantage of the things they normally will take advantage of, whether it's usually these were pollution cases, like water pollution cases or air pollution cases, you know, is, is there something about it that's more regulatory or criminal? So even identifying just like the source of law that gives rise to nuisance is itself tough. And you can see how I've articulated the standards, like it's an unreasonable interference with a public right. Well, what is unreasonable? What's a public right? Like all of those things are incredibly contested. So historically, like I said, like they were usually something that kind of interfered with your ability to use the land. It might've been water pollution, could have been air pollution. But um, um, more recently, the, the public nuisance and private nuisance tort has been used for kind of social ills. So it's been used um, for lead paint um, in housing units, it's been used to um, in asbestos cases. It's been used in uh, probably, probably the most notably, like in in gun and tobacco cases, as a theory by which um, cities and municipalities could sue to recover for the nuisance that was created by too many guns, or the public health effects of everyone smoking cigarettes, and thus depleting um, the coffers of state governments to kind of deal with them. Um, uh, the, it, it's because it's so ill-defined that one of the things that the defendants around the country have done is they've moved to dismiss on the ground that, that, mm -hmm. that these nuisances shouldn't apply to opioids. I, I don't know how well that works. It's, it's been, with the, just a few exceptions, I actually think it's a pretty good analogy because it's you know there there have been criminal nuisance claims against people who deal drugs. So I don't I don't know if you know just because they're dealing drugs at like this corporate level that necessarily means that it's not still something that can interfere with a public right. But I will say like one of the most controversial things that really hasn't received probably enough attention is. Um, the types of damages they pursue, which was, I think, another part of your question. Like, what yeah. what type of damages can you get? Um, and early on um, in the consolidated cases in Ohio, um, under federal RICO and under negligence and under nuisance, the cities and, and counties had a very um, ambitious view about the types of things they can collect damages for. So. Uh, the types of things that cities are combating on a, on a day to day level are are increased crime, um, deaths, increased uses of their hospitals, police, um, and their entire like and mostly shaky public health apparatus. 
So they've sought to collect funds for all of that. And that in and of itself is kind of ambitious. And it might even be a little stretch of some basic principles we have in tort law that usually try to place limits on pure economic harm that you can recover, especially when you're a city. So there, there are some doctrines that typically would say a city normally couldn't recover for things it was going to spend its tax revenues on anyway. Like that's just that's just mm -hmm. something the city does. But uh, um, but the city was allowed to collect many of those things in the theory that it's spending um, billions, maybe even trillions of dollars f collectively in fighting the opioid epidemic. And that that is why the scale and the stakes are so high in all these cases. Like you can you can have a, a case brought on behalf of a relatively small county like Lake County in Ohio um, or, or a, a county in, in Suffolk and the stakes are still in the billions of dollars. I think the, the Suffolk case was worth about $8 billion. Um, and, um, um, and yet, you know, there, there's, there's no way that if every county collected $8 billion in the country, we're, we're talking about just something that, it's not just something that's bankrupting or crippling liability, it's just not something that they can pay. Um, and so one of the big problems I think this litigation poses is when you have damages and harm that so far outstrip like what the defendants are capable of paying well what does a fair resolution look like and what what share of responsibility should these different companies have for it should it be based on their market share how big they are how much they did wrong like all of those things are kind of at play they're all the kind of like backwater of tort law like joint and several liability that that no one ever really thinks too much about and we always kind of gloss over because it's the end of the class but it's really important here these are the multi-billion and trillion dollar questions here and the there's one wrinkle i think as i understand it in the in the new york case and i should add that you know we're recording this i believe it's october 6th I'm pretty close to that. That's, that's the correct date. I know this is the first week of October. Um, You're right. It's say, the sixth. <laughs> so that's that's an undisputed fact for purposes <laughs> of the podcast. Um, the uh, but this is a case that began. The trial started in the summer, um, yes. and it's been going on um, continuously. There have been a number of settlements that have occurred with respect to a number of the defendants, and you've you've touched on that. But the 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 wrinkle. Um, I think in the New York case is that we have a jury impaneled. Yeah, we have a jury impaneled, and uh, because the case is ongoing, that is, to, to my knowledge, that you know, as of this week, uh, the case is scheduled to continue um, through this month or into you know to continue further this month. Um, any sense of um, how having a jury impaneled here um, could affect? Uh, could affect the proceedings. And in saying that, it, it, it's more than just, well, how have the parties presented their case, right. you know, knowing that there are lay citizens instead of just to a judge. But even in terms of the types of questions that the jury might be asked to answer, um, assuming we get to the end, that is, we get to a verdict with questions answered by the jury, um, uh, how could that possibly affect um, subsequent stages, including an appeal. So um, I realize that there's a lot of sort of speculation built into the question because right. the jury is, they're still sitting and we don't know what they've done or what we, you know, they haven't been asked to decide anything yet. And yet any way in which um, having the, the jury impaneled here, um, uh, how that could affect say the ultimate resolution or ultimate outcome of this case as compared to the other cases that you've referred to, especially those that have concluded, um, uh, you know, in which there was not a jury present. You know, um, I have a couple of general answers to that, but then maybe I'll have a question for you about this too, because I have a question about why the why a jury is hearing this here. So, um, you know, this this interesting this has been an interesting litigation to see unfold, because at least in some of the other um, litigations, most notably in Oklahoma and some others, we've seen um, roles reverse. So typically when we think of uh, what a 
a plaintiff attorney and a savvy defense attorney wants when they're litigating a mass tort case in terms of the decision maker um, is the, the plaintiff attorney typically wants like a good jury. And we think that the defense attorney might want to judge because we think that like usually the, you know, the, if you're going to have a bunch of complicated defendants defenses, you'd rather have a judge kind of sift through them. And you might be more worried that maybe the jury is going to be emotional or carried away with damages and, and that you might not be able to provide enough of like a, uh, of a homespun argument to kind of defend against like the biggest public health crisis the U.S. has seen. So we normally might think that defense attorneys would prefer a judge, plaintiff's attorneys might prefer juries, but, you know, that hasn't always been so clear. And I think the reason for that is because of the other dynamics that are also at play when uh, these trials are taking place. So some of these trials, many of these trials um, have been televised. Um, and if you have a televised trial, um, at least for the trial portion, it means that the jury might not hear and hence the broader jury, like the public, you know, all of us watching on TV might not see all of the evidence that a judge in a bench trial might see. Because, you know, you present to the judge and then you might, someone might object and then the judge is like, I can see this or, okay, I'll exclude it, you know. But when it's a jury, like those eliminate motions can be made in advance of the proceeding and that evidence can be excluded. And so in the Oklahoma trial, you know, we actually saw Johnson & Johnson asking for a jury. Now, it said it was because it thought it could do better in front of a jury. It thought like, you know, it wanted, it wanted to vindicate its good name in front of a jury. But one reason for that might simply be that um, we have rules of evidence for jury that screens out information that um, a defendant might not want to come out because it's very embarrassing. And we're, we constantly see you know, like embarrassing stuff coming out that even if, you know, the defendant still feels it's not liable, it would just rather not see. Um, so that's actually one area where roles reverse. Another is that, you know, in the state courts, some judges are elected. Um, and if the judge who's elected is also the one who's responsible for not just awarding um, damages at you, as you might, but also kind of constructing some type of nuisance abatement plan, which is often something that's kind of presented as part of a nuisance case, then suddenly the judge is almost like this unique, unique political figure. You know, it's kind of sitting in judgment according to a set of rules, you know, but it's also like thinking about like how to provide like a future benefit to um, his or her city or county or state. And, um, and if you're a defense attorney, you might not like that. You might not, especially if it's an elected judge, you know. Um, and so you could kind of see why, like, then again, like, there again, you might actually prefer like the slightly more politically insulated jury to decide certain questions as opposed to the judge. So it's one of these really interesting cases where because of the public nature of the harm, because a number of these trials are taking place in state court, there's some in federal court, but a lot are in state court. And even the cases in federal court, there's defense attorneys don't always like the judges they have. We, we've seen this kind of a little bit of a role reversal um, uh, where defendants are asking for jury trials and the plaintiffs are fine with bench trials. Um, and in a nuisance case, the normal rule is that because it's um, a case that's proceeding in equity, you know, the nuisance cases are that you can usually bring those cases in front of a judge. Um, and it's actually kind of the exception that you have juries hearing these cases. So the only case I can immediately think of where a jury was impaneled um, in one of these kinds of public nuisance cases was um, when the NAACP brought a, a, a case against, or maybe it was New York City. No, I think it was the NAACP brought a case against a number of gun defendants in New York City. Um, and Judge Weinstein, even though it was a nuisance case, impaneled an advisory jury. Um, and that was conceived of and thought of as a really exotic procedure. But he thought, well, this is a way to kind of insulate myself because I've been making all of these rulings that have been adverse to defendants. So this way I can insulate myself, but also, you know, it's about the public community. So the public community should have a voice. Um, so I, I don't know if, if those totally answer what that means here for your direct question, like how would that influence 
the types of things that a jury thinks about in trying to do it. I do think like it's harder for the jury to think beyond money. So like it, it makes sense if it's like purely money damages, but if you're talking about like some of these abatement plans and, and that's literally what a state AG or a city might present, they'll say, okay, we need this money, but there'll be a plan. Like we need these institutions to um, be set up to kind of fight opioid addiction, meet people where they are. And here's, here's our five point plan for doing that. Like it's harder for me to imagine a jury knowing how to go about thinking about that. And I think that's, that's what makes this even more complicated than just the fact that it's a complicated case. It's the remedy is so complicated. Oh, but here's my question for you. Why is a jury hearing this case? I don't understand. So what, why, how, how is it that a jury is, is, is that just because I'm, I'm weak on my New York civil procedure. So why did it come to a New York jury instead of like a judge when normally nuisance cases are heard by judges? Yeah, and this is one that I haven't been able to ferret out. I, it may have been, you know, that I didn't look hard enough or, or just haven't, you know, been able to identify uh, why it is there was a jury sitting. And related to that, I'm not sure yet what their, what tasks they will be assigned. That is what questions they'll be asked. and. Yeah. Uh, what could happen afterwards. That is, assuming we reach the end in this trial and then there's a verdict, what then has to happen? Um, so, uh, hmm. so. I mean, is, I can I can also relate one personal anecdote that relates to this question, which is sure. that, you know, when I, when I was a law clerk, Judge Weinstein had all of the major tobacco litigation in the country following the state AG settlement. These were largely claims that were brought by like all of the insurers across the country, because the, the theory by which the state AGs collected their $240 billion settlement was that it just totally deprived the state coffers of their, the, uh, their abilities to like kind of provide for care through health costs. So these were, this was like the private version of those suits. And they were brought by uh, tr asbestos trusts, labor union trusts, um, and Blue Cross and Blue Shield and a large number of other insurers. Um, and, and I sat and, and helped oversee like three jury trials. They were the, some of the only jury trials involving the tobacco litigation. And so I think there's some interesting parallels between that people usually bring between the two. And, and so, you know, in watching it and just kind of uh, over, just kind of seeing how the juries act, like these are very long trials. So those trials were on average about 10 weeks each. I don't know how long this has been going, but but any, but any going for two and a half to three months in a trial, like it becomes a formative part of like, it, it feels like a different job. You know, it's you suddenly over time just begin to kind of feel like, oh, like this at first was kind of inconvenient. Like I work full time doing this, but but now you actually like your role as a citizen almost changes and your attitude kind of changes. and. And, and I always found that the jurors took their jobs really seriously. They were presented with the same kinds of complicated evidence. They were, they, because it was a similar theory of a case. It was um, that the cigarette companies had downplayed the addictive qualities of their cigarettes and, and people got really sick. Um, and, um, and this had consequences for the insurers as well. Um, and those, and there were large, and so there were economic models and psychologists who testified. It was a sampling of testimony. So it was the same types of trial techniques. And some of them struggled to pay attention, but they really took their jobs seriously and generally tried to pay attention. And um, in the one case that actually issued a damage verdict, it might've been one of the only damage verdicts ever under that theory of a case that was issued against a tobacco company, it was totally inconsistent with all of the different theories of the case. It was, it was so interesting. So it was a, it was a $3 billion case because it was, it was thought of and proceeded under a federal RICO theory, which is how some of these opioid cases are also brought. It's called RICO, but what it really means is like a wire fraud, you know, like just committing fraud across state lines. Um, and, uh, uh, and so the the damages were astronomical, um, but they ultimately awarded, I wanted to say about $60 million. 
um, after an eight and a half week trial, which, which sounds like a lot of money, but really is not um, when you have like just legions of attorneys litigating the case. And I think a lot of people scratch their heads like, oh, what is this? What does this really relate to? What is, what is, how do the damages here match this? And I think there was a reason for it, which is that they didn't think they committed fraud. They didn't think that they'd violated RICO. They instead believe they violated a consumer protection statute in New York. Um, and under that theory, the damages were just a lot smaller and they were able to calculate them out. And in fact, the day of the verdict, it was like the worst type of message for a defense attorney to hear where, where the, the jurors came out with a note and said, can we have a calculator? So, you know, I think that, it, I, I think that in spite of a lot of the arguments people make about lay jurors deciding these really complex cases, um, in these really big ones, like they, they can take the, the, the cases very seriously. There's very able attorneys who can, who can digest these complicated issues and really present them well. Um, and the juries have a lot of resources themselves to try to decide them. So I do believe that they're competent to do it and there's a lot of social value in having them do it. Um, but because they're in the black box, you know, it, it also makes you wonder whether even this most transparent form of, of resolving these cases, it's the one thing that's not a settlement, is still not all that transparent. Um, yes, I truly am fascinated to see, uh, you know, how this, will it go to the end and what will, what questions will the jury be asked and, and what their answers will be. Yeah. Um, so uh, that'll be part two when I bring you back. Um, the, uh, the, the last, I think, question I wanted to touch on because um, I really think we've covered, you know, so much that, you know, I, I kind of want to tell all the first year professors, you should have your students listen to this, <laughs> the, the, uh, you know, especially those, in, you know, the torts professors and the civil procedure professors. Now I'm going to ask you a question, right, for the for the upper year electives. Okay. Um, which really is sort of the you know the shorthand, the administrative law question, in the sense of um, you know, uh, is there, could there have been, or will there be, um, you know, a better way to do this? And this is kind of the question uh, in my mind. I'm sort of thinking about. Um, uh, the, the relationship or the connection between regulation and litigation. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a fairly broad question, but of course we're talking about, you know, regulated pharmaceutical drugs. Um, and uh, how does that sort of, uh, what does this, these, this series of cases, including the New York case, you know, with where we are now, what does that say about the relationship between regulation and litigation? I mean, I, I guess I have a couple of reactions. So reaction number one is there actually have been, you know, other regulatory approaches that perform some of the same types of things that, you know, a, a massive litigation would do. So there have been some states, and I think in, even including New York, that have taxed the opioid companies, created funds and allocated those funds to social programs that will likely kind of mirror or like parallel social programs that are created after all of this, assuming this ends. Um, so, uh, so there actually have been some of those legislative approaches um, and they've, they've happened, you know, in a smattering of state legislatures. Um, interestingly, I think as a result of the litigation, they'll also have to be and because there's already model laws being written, there also will be legislation and regulation for administering all of this. So, well, we will get there. Um, one uh, good example of this is the model settlement that's been created by all the state AGs. So the whole reason for this dynamic, why are there 2000 counties doing this when that's never happened before? And it's true, it's never happened before. It's all kind of an outgrowth of the tobacco settlement where monies, you know, that uh, were settled in one of the largest deals ever, still ever, um, to compensate for the harms related to smoking 
um, mostly didn't go to that. They went into state coffers and the monies were spent on education, on there was a recession, on paving roads. And so in the wake of the opioid litigation, the public health community realized like we have to begin organizing earlier and get moving faster. Um, and, um, and so what's happened is like as um, as these deals are being negotiated, we have like this $26 billion deal that whose deadline is set to expire, uh, I think in January. So we might see a lot of settlements happening right around January. Um, all of those state AGs as part of the deal to make sure the monies actually went to opioid related things began like negotiating laws at the same time they were settling. Texas is actually a really interesting example of this, where in Texas, they negotiated the, the rough outlines of a settlement. I think it's roughly like New York's, like a $1.5 billion settlement. Um, but at the same time they were doing that, they also negotiated with the state legislature to create a whole administrative apparatus for distributing where the money's gonna go, for trying to allocate monies, like 25% of it goes to like particularly hard hit or emergency regions. Um, and it's all happening through state legislation to just make sure that that money actually goes to those things and not to like the next budget crisis. And so, so we are actually getting there. We're just kind of getting there in reverse. We're doing the litigation first. And then after the litigation, all of these states are passing legislation that will create administrative bodies for overseeing how the funds work. They'll be staffed by both folks at the state and the local level. Um, they're hoping that those bodies might include other you know, private stakeholders. And some of those funds are ultimately going to go not just, mostly not to people, they're going to go to programs. Um, so I guess, you know, big picture, if one sees the opioid um, epidemic as a um, as a legislative and regulatory failure. And I think there's a way in which you can say that. Like here we have like a bipartisan collection of state AGs that all agree this is a problem. So at least the head law enforcement officer for every state agrees this is a problem, but we're not able to do anything in Congress despite several efforts to try to do something in Congress. Um, and and that is the just and if that's a justification for when court should act, you know, when our state agencies and our legislatures can't, like it's done a okay job, not a great job, but uh, an okay one. You know, the, if the alternatives, if no one is acting, then I guess it's okay um, because we in the end might get some of these programs, but we're doing it in a really costly and odd way we're not doing it and i mean i mean i guess maybe we're settling these cases in the same way that we make legislation you know it's all kind of happening be, you know behind back rooms with different interest groups but instead of doing it like through a legislative form we're doing it you know in in a federal courthouse in cleveland and a state courthouse in new york um and, and and so maybe that's okay if we just want to think that all these institutions are fungible you know like it, what's legislation in a courthouse versus legislation in a rulemaking in an agency or legislation in a, in a state legislature. But if you actually think that these different institutions are supposed to be doing something unique, you know, like the courts are supposed to be holding people accountable, the regulators are supposed to be preventing people from causing harm, and the legislature is supposed to be like writing prospective laws to try to make us safe and provide funding for things we need, it's all happened backwards. You know, the, it's the courts that were ultimately responsible, not necessarily for holding people accountable because they're all settling, but for being the place in which transactions occur that make kind of rules and laws. It's, it's the regulators have not been really that great at dealing with the crisis, but they have been good at just kind of instigating the litigation. You know, like they, they've been actually the ones that arguably are holding folks accountable. Maybe it's because they want to be governors soon too. And the legislatures, they're just, they're the last, they're, you know, they're the last in line. They're just like sitting back and watching the money come in <laughs> and then approving it, you know, just kind of approving this. And so I kind of feel like, um, like we have like a separation of powers, but all of those different powers are doing something that we don't imagine that they're supposed to do. And, um, and maybe that is just kind of the nature of where some of these mega mass torts that I was talking about are going to be heading. So like, you know, this is one mega mass tort. I think 
climate change litigation to the extent it moves forward, because it might not, but to the extent it continues moving forward here and there, not just in our country, but abroad, like we're seeing these cases being brought abroad as well, maybe that's another place where we see this kind of weird switching of the separation of powers. Um, and, uh, and, and maybe that will also be true for other kind of public health crises going forward too. Yeah, well, no, I, uh, I, I think I'm gonna, I think we're gonna stop there. Yeah. Um, only because uh, uh, I can be confident now that in the second year curriculum, at least here at Toro, there's something <laughs> for the con law students um, with our discussion of separation of powers. Yeah. Um, and while that's intended, that is said in a jocular way, really what you say is spot on in terms of the dynamics of these different branches of government um, at this moment, certainly with this issue. So uh, thank you. I mean, thank you for your, for your time, for your thoughts. Um, and um, I, I hope that at some point we'll come back and, and, and do part two, depending upon what happens with you know, the rest of the case here in New York and elsewhere. So thank you so much, Adam. I would love that. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun.